right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this week's Wednesday webinar. We are going to give it just a moment before we get started. Thank you all for joining us. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy Wednesday, first webinar of February. It's fun that we're starting this like right on February 1st. I like that. Okay, we'll give it just another moment to let a few more people in before we get started. Here it is. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on Out for Blood, the need for menstrual research. My name is Alsa Murtha, and I'm the Manager of Strategic Communications here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you are joining us from one of our social media platforms, uh, go ahead and enter your questions in the comments. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will post to our speaker after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, February 3rd. I am joined today by Dr. Mary Beth Griffin, Assistant Professor at Rutgers University. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to get us started. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking about menstrual health and menstrual health research and just all things period related. Um, so I'm super excited to be here. We're going to talk a bit about some of the science and some of the stigma and some of the social kind of construction of menstruation before getting into the need for menstrual research. People are like, well, but we've been bleeding for since the beginning of time. I was like, yes, but we don't know a lot about it. I mean, we know about it, but like not really, really about it. Um, so I have obviously some slides that I will be sharing, um, and feel free if you want to put questions in whenever I'm happy to answer questions as they come along and we'll have some Q and a at the end. overview of what we're going to talk about. Just first off, starting with bio 101 to make sure that we all know about the menstrual cycle. Um, I know we should, and I'm somebody who spent my entire life thinking about sexual and reproductive health. Um, and I became a trained doula about, I started my training um, this time last year. And there's so much that I didn't know about my body and things that I assumed that I knew about that I just didn't know about. So I find it's really helpful to start there. Then we'll talk about, um, uh, the, the history of periods. We'll talk a little bit about uh, menstrual slang and then blood and pleasure and then periods and pop culture. Um, so let's start with a bio. So first off, I wanted to say that normal is a spectrum. It is not a singular point. So when we talk about menstrual cycles, they're based on models that are presented on a 28 day cycle. That is the kind of average point in time. A normal cycle length is between 21 and 35 days. If you are having a period fewer than every 21 days, you should maybe talk to your doctor about that. If your menstrual cycle is longer than 35 days, we recommend talking to your physician about that as well. Um, all models are shown on a five-day menstrual period, so uh, assuming that somebody bleeds for five days. A normal period length is between two and eight days. I myself have a cycle length of 24 days and I bleed for about three, three and a half days. That is my normal. I also really recommend that people track their cycles because it's important if you're talking about menstrual issues or changes in your menstrual cycle to be able to speak to what is normal for you, not what is normal kind of out there in the world, but what's normal for you because that helps then set that kind of baseline so you know when something is abnormal for you and then you can get kind of more targeted or, or ask like more targeted questions to your providers. Um, I also want to say just as a, a thing to kind of highlight from the beginning, for people who are transgendered or gender expansive and you are taking testosterone, you're on T, this is a gender forming hormone that may or may not affect the menstrual cycle. This is definitely also something that we need to do more research on. Um, so 
it's possible that if you're on tea, that could stop your menstrual cycle altogether, which is even more important about you knowing what was is normal, was normal for you before talking about these uh, different changes that might be happening. And again, this is also related to the dosage, the frequency, and the length of time that somebody has been using testosterone. So just to put that out there. So when we're talking then about the menstrual cycle from day one, that is the first day of your period. So your hormone levels drop from the end of your previous menstrual cycle, signaling then that your body should break down that uterine lining and then it should leave your body and it does that through menstruation. Um, usually your bleeding lasts about five days, but again, normal looks different for everybody. On day seven-ish, again, not for everybody, your bleeding stops um, and your hormones then uh, cause follicles in the ovaries to develop. One of those follicles will reach maturity. It will release that egg that is in that follicle and that is ovulation. So that follicle that develops to maturity, the uterine lining starts to thicken because it is waiting for that egg to travel down the fallopian tube into the uterus where maybe it will meet with some sperm, become fertilized. If that egg is fertilized, it implants into the lining of the uterus. That is the moment of pregnancy um, is when that fertilized egg plants into the lining of the uterus. If that doesn't happen, and so about day 14 is the day that you menstruate. So uh, not menstruate, I'm sorry, that's the day that you ovulate, right? That's the, uh, the egg is released from the ovary travels into the fallopian tube. I think the most interesting thing about the entire menstrual cycle is that our bodies know instinctively, biologically, the best day for us to become pregnant because that is what the body is trying to do. It is preparing our menstrual cycle. Every month is preparing us to become pregnant. So your body will delay that ovulation until conditions are best for you or like optimize for a person to become pregnant. Um, so you, we've all heard that phrase like, oh, my period is late. That's not true. Your period is never, ever late. What is late is ovulation. And then if ovulation happens late, that second half of your menstrual cycle, the luteal phase is always 14 days. So that just gets pushed back. So it's not actually your period being late. It's that your body was under stress or something like that, and that delayed ovulation. Um, and so we can delay ovulation because we're, our, we have changes in the way we're eating, our sleeping patterns, stress levels. If we're traveling, if we're not drinking enough water, any anything can cause ovulation to be delayed. So that's why we see some fluctuation sometimes in people's menstrual cycles. Um, and I think the other super, super cool fact about ovulation is that a human is only fertile. Uh, a, a human with a uterus is only fertile for 24 hours. If the egg does not meet with sperm within that 24 hour window, it dies and it just kind of like lives in the uterus. It hangs out until that uterine lining breaks down and you have your period again. So we spend all of this time thinking about how to prevent pregnancy among people who have uteruses, when in reality, we're only fertile for about 24 hours super, super fascinating. Again, things that I didn't know until I was tra training to become a doula. So on day 14, until however long, the egg travels down the fallopian tube towards the uterus. If the egg and the sperm meet, that is fertilization. If that fertilized egg implants into the uterine lining, that is implantation, that is when pregnancy occurs. On day 25, if the egg isn't fertilized, those hormone levels drop. That signals that breakdown of that uterine lining for you to start your next menstrual cycle. And that egg then breaks apart and will be shed along with the lining of the uterus. So just kind of running through the bio. So now I wanna talk a little bit about ancient menstruation and what we knew and who was constructing this knowledge of our periods and our menstrual cycles. This represents literally the birth of the patriarchy because medical knowledge in the ancient world was constructed by men, by white men, by kind of middle-aged white men. So there were two schools of thought about menstruation. One, that bleeding was a sign of a medical problem in bodies that had uteruses. And two, that lack of bleeding in bodies that have uteruses was also a medical problem. So basically what they're saying is, if you have a uterus, you have some kind of medical problem, which we know isn't true. 
But what we do know is that the people who are constructing this medical knowledge didn't have uteruses. So therefore it was different to their experience. So if it wasn't their experience, there must be something abnormal or problematic about it. So their belief was that bodies with uteruses created harmful substances and menstruation was the purging of all of this excess, which is just kind of wild to think about now. So I'm going to take us back to the beginning with uh, Pliny the Elder. So he is, is kind of like a, a scientist for that, like the day back then in antiquity. And his masterwork, Naturalis Historia, was published in 77 AD. And Pliny the Elder claimed that if you even came into contact with menstrual blood, all kinds of bad things were going to happen to you. I'm going to read the quote in its entirety because I think we just need to understand the origin of our menstrual knowledge. So menstrual blood turns new wine sour, crops touched by it become barren, grafts die, seeds and gardens are dried up, the fruit of trees falls off, the edge of steel and the gleam of ivory are dulled, hives of bees will die, even bronze and iron are at once seized by rust, and a horrible smell fills the air, to taste it drives dogs mad and infects their bites with an incurable poison. To which I say, if my menstrual blood could do all of that, bring it on. I would love to have that kind of power. But alas, we know that it doesn't. But if this is where our knowledge is constructed, it's not hard to believe that menstrual myths would then persist into the modern day. He also claimed that if pregnant that pregnant animals would miscarry if they were touched at or even looked by looked at by a pregnant human. So again, we had a long way to go to undo some of this medical knowledge, medical knowledge there in air quotes. So there's also medical misinformation that happens uh, in ancient Greek and ancient Rome. So these are some of our kind of leading thinkers at the time. So Soranus of Ephesus says that menstruation is thought to be caused by catharsis or excess that builds up in the body. And somehow we have to get rid of all of this like excess. Um, Sella says that monthly bleeding was necessary to release a buildup of toxins. Um, otherwise, if we didn't, people would die. People with uteruses would die. Uh, Hippocrates says that female flesh was just more absorbent than male flesh. So these spongy women just soaked up more blood and then again had to release the excess. And then Aristotle says that menstruation was similar to the blood flow associated with animal sacrifice. And it's something that we should then be capturing and perhaps using for magic or in other rituals which I think of all of the beliefs is maybe the coolest, but also not exactly right. And the other thing we know about menstruation and antiquity is that women were very much into free bleeding. And what I mean by free bleeding is just they weren't using a collected a collection method. So for people who are wealthier, they would practice seclusion where they would stay indoors in rooms until their menstrual cycle was over because the blood is just kind of going where the blood wants to go. For anyone who is working class, they would often bleed through their clothes. So this is where we see the origin of the term on the rag. It was, it was a, a the collection device that people were using was just old clothes, old fabric, right? Hence the slang term on the rag. So we're moving forward quite a bit forward in time. We're talk a little bit about Victorian menstruation because this is where it starts to shift and resemble something more like the menstrual experience that maybe we all know of today. So medical scholars in Victorian England knew that menstruation was related to pregnancy. So we've dispelled the, dispelled the myth that it's just like excess fluids and toxins that we need to get rid of. And we now know that it's connected to pregnancy, but they still thought that menstruators were invalids, um, meaning that if while you were menstruating, you were unfit for any great mental or physical labor, that essentially you should just be lying in bed, resting and recovering, which doesn't sound terrible, especially if you're somebody who um, has maybe more severe PMS symptoms and things like that. Uh, but this idea that that menstruating bodies just can't handle thinking <laughs> or going about kind of daily life um, and things like that is just kind of interesting to think about, like how much how much our knowledge has changed over time. Collection methods in the Victorian era were often really uncomfortable and very bulky. They were cloth pads just tied or buttoned to belts, the things that go around your waist, uh, very much kind of held in place, kind of like a girdle. 
they were really large, like diapers, um, which meant that you didn't change them that often. And that wet fabric caused ch chafing uh, of the vulva and also of the thighs. Um, urination then also became a longer process because you had to undress those big kind of Victorian era gowns with all of those petticoats and things like that and to lift up, had to pull down stockings, had to pull off your, your period diaper, things like that. Um, and then the cleaning process then included washing and hanging them to dry in public view. So now something menstruation isn't something that's secluded. It's something that's very visible, meaning that people knew when you were menstruating because they could see your laundry, like literally see your business hanging in your backyard unless you're drying your clothes indoors. This is also though where we start to see periods associated with profit. So companies realizing that there's a market for making period collection method, period products collection methods um, that are more streamlined, that are maybe better able to fit under clothes, clothes that are starting to fit much more narrowly if we're thinking now in like fashion history, moving from these big kind of bulky skirts into that slim silhouette of a flapper. Um, so they then start producing these kind of proto pads and tampons in the late 19th century. And they're selling these through mail order catalogs. Um, and the adverts are calling them things like absorbent health napkins or serviette supporters. And they're generally then made of sateen. So a uh, a much more fine fabric that wouldn't cling as much um, if it was coming into contact with the fabric of the outer layer of your clothing. Um, and about 1920s, so very much the flapper era, Kimberly Clark uh, developed bandages in, for World War II that became the basis of Kotex pads. So that kind of adhesive. We start seeing then that retail stores are starting to carry pads in like 1921. Um, and kind of the most commercial kind of tampons making their way into the market in 1936. So now it's no longer something we have to send away for and have to plan in advance for, but we can just kind of pop down to the store and, and pick up some pads like we do today. Um, and one of the more really interesting things that happens then in advertising is that uh, they transform the messages that women are receiving about their menstrual cycle. Um, this idea of like positive thinking and you can positive think your way out of cramp pain <laughs> um, and things like that. This is really then where we see that sort of insidious nature about the invisibility of menstrual pain, of pain, of femme bodies coming in. This idea that like, well, if you were just thinking positively enough, you wouldn't be doubled over with menstrual cramps. Um, and that this idea that if you are experiencing discomfort, it's something that you as the menstruator have done wrong. Um, it's because you're not getting enough sleep, you're not eating properly, you're not exercising enough, or it's just something that's in your head and the symptoms aren't really as bad as you're making it out to be. So really starting now to see this idea of like, oh, so it's the patriarchy combined with not listening to patients when they're in that in that room with their physician and understanding what our bodies are actually going through. So moving into the kind of modern menstrual menstrual era, um, we're seeing then sanitary belts. So the picture of this uh, lady in the corner, she is Mary Beatrice Davidson Kenner. She is an inventor who was really interested in inventing things that had practical purpose that would change people's daily lives. So she creates this sanitary belt, which you can see in the bottom picture, that features an adjustable strap for different size bodies. So she is very much size inclusive. So yay for that. It has a moisture proof napkin pocket that helps stop those leaks. Uh, reduces chafing even more. And she's the first one then to use that adhesive to secure the pad into place on this belt. And sanitary belts were widely used until the 1970s, which I know is 50 years ago now, but it doesn't really seem that long ago when you say it out loud. So pads and tampons become the height of menstrual fashion. Uh, this is also due to then thinner fabrics higher hemlines, so the introduction of like the mini skirt and closer cut silhouettes. So a lot of this is also then determined by like costume history, fashion history, things like that. Um, so now we have more options than ever for menstrual hygiene. So we have pads that come in a variety of sizes and absorbencies. We have reusable pads that are environmentally friendly. Um, also the period underwear kind of falling under that reusable pads. Um, we have tampons as well, 
just pointing out that they're the only menstrual collection method that is approved by the FDA um, and sets standards around absorbency levels. This is tied to toxic shock syndrome and things like that. Um, and then menstrual cups and discs, which are then inserted into the vaginal ca canal to connect, uh, to connect, to collect the blood. Um, and you should then be thinking about manufacturer's recommendations and things like that, checking out different sizes. If you're a person who has given birth, uh, the vaginal canal widens out a bit. So you will need a menstrual cup that's a little bit wider to make sure that it's fitting securely up into the vaginal canal near the cervix. So it opens fully and stays placed there. Um, are there any other things I want to say? I don't think there are other things I want to say about, about these things. But yeah, more variety than ever, sort of an explosion in the market. Um, and so that brings us then to the, what we know kind of about modern day menstruation and kind of catching us up on what we what we're thinking about. So this is just a short clip from a Canadian, a comedian named uh, Marsha Belsky. And she is going to tell us the story about when Sally Ride went into space for the first time. This last song um, is the story about the first American woman to ever go to space, Sally Ride. Remember when NASA sent a woman to space for only six days and they gave her 100 tampons, 100 tampons. And they asked, will that be enough? They didn't know that was enough. These are our nation's greatest minds. They are literally rocket scientists. They also tied the tampons together by the strings like sausages. A hundred tampons. A hundred tampons. So the song goes on a little bit longer. I encourage everyone to find it. It's available on YouTube and it's it's funny. I I also grew up in Huntsville, Alabama. If you'll allow me just a little bit of a, of a side note, um, where NASA is headed. So, so many of my friends' parents are literally also rocket scientists. And now I just picture like my best friend from middle school's dad being like, you know what we need to do? A hundred tampons, that's what's going into space. <laughs> So given that this is where we're thinking about menstrual knowledge in 1983, which is, okay, a little bit closer, but still kind of far back in the past, not surprising that we just don't know enough about menstrual knowledge. That's also reflected then in the advertising for menstruation, for menstrual products and things like that. So this is a commercial from 1985 featuring one Courtney Cox before she got famous. This ad is... Uh, a watershed moment because this is the first time on television when we are seeing a pad or a tampon company actually use the word period in their advertising. You changed your life for one week because of the bad time of the month. Still using pads? Then let me tell it to you straight. Tampons can change the way you feel about that time. Tampons, tampons protect differently than a pad, so you feel cleaner. Feeling cleaner is more comfortable. Plus, more women use tampons than any other tampon or pad. Now that's something. Remember, there's a feeling with tampons. It can actually change the way you feel about your period. So again, still thinking about this idea of like cleanliness and things like that. So we're moving forward in menstrual advertising, we're looking now at 1990. This is the first time a commercial is actually showing a pad on TV. It's so like 1990. Yeah, that, we're going to go ahead and say that that's not that long ago because Taylor Swift was born in 1989. And if Taylor Swift was alive, it's not that long ago in history. So network executives uh, and, and network uh, one and the ad executives wanted people to see how absorbent their products were, but were really worried that all of us in the audience would be disgusted if they used any kind of liquid that actually looked like a period. So they used this blue liquid. And you're like thinking like, yeah, but like why blue? 
the idea is when they were doing their market research that psychologically we associate the blue color blue, like blue liquid like this, with things like Windex or cleaning products or bleach. So they're also then subtly reinforcing not only the absorbency of their product, but also the fact that it's going to make you feel cleaner and fresher. Also then implying that menstrual blood was somehow uh, unsanitary or dirty or unclean. And we know that that's just not the case. It's just some blood that's coming out of our bodies. It's like, it's, it's sanitary. It's, it, you know, it's fine. Um, so the first time we see any kind of redness in connection to menstrual advertising is in 2011. And that is legitimately not that long ago, right? Like it's like 12, okay, it's 12 years, but still um, not that, that long ago. So this is an ad for always uh, for the pad company. It's a watershed moment to actually show periods that look kind of like menstrual blood. We should note though, that this is kind of like a cartoon sketched out drawing and it's not anything that actually looks like what menstruation actually happens, right? So it's, you know, a computer rendering, but still progress. Uh, and then moving forward in time to the last bit that we'll see is a moment where we're actually letting there be blood. So this happens in 2017. So right about six years ago, it's a, uh, an ad from the UK uh, from a company called Bodyform, where they're actually showing not only red liquid on a pad for the first time, but actually also menstrual blood in that advertisement. So we'll watch it. It's a pretty short clip. Absorbent core. So all of these things I think are really important because we're starting to see just how much we're not talking about menstruation, right? We also know that capitalism and period poverty is also a growing issue that people all over the world are facing. One in five U.S. teens struggle to afford any kind of period products, and the average cost of a box of 36 tampons is about $7 or $8 for pads, and then need depending on how heavy your flow is, uh, maybe a box of tampons every couple of months. So it starts to add up and then you can bounce that over a person's lifetime. And we're talking a lot of money. Currently 35 states in the United States tax period products is non-essential. This idea that there are things that we can go without, um, which again, I guess it's kind of my, I mean, I guess we could free bleed, right? But that's kind of mind boggling that they're somehow not essential. Um, and then governmental assistance programs for people who are low income, like the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, SNAP, or Women, Infants, and Children, WIC, don't cover the cost of menstrual hygiene supplies. So people who are low income who also menstruate are also at then a disproportionate burden of being able to afford menstrual products. Also, food stamps don't cover menstrual products at all. So we know that this is not only are we not talking about menstruation, but now we know that there are also structural barriers to people being able to um, manage their period, manage their flow, and, and think about how they're going to use collection devices. I always say, this is one of the things that I like to kind of propose whenever I talk about menstruation. I would love it if everyone who menstruates decided we could all come together and pick one month where we're going to free bleed, meaning we're not going to use a collection method, and we're just going to let the world deal with our blood. And I think that that is the way that we would get politicians to instantly, like one day to the next, be like, you know what? No taxes on no taxes on period products. Also, we're just going to provide them for free to everyone who menstruates. So I don't know who's with me in this form of protest, but I'm very serious about it. And I think if I say it enough, I'll get enough people on board to do like, I don't know, maybe free bleed February. That's got a beautiful alliteration since it's also the first day of February. So Moving into this, now that I've set the stage about why menstrual research is so important, it's a monthly occurrence. Uh, the medical invisibility of female patients, femme-bodied patients, patients with uterus is well-documented and contributes to our limited healthcare access. We have routinely normalized femme pain. Um, there's the lack of medical discussion that happens around, reinforce, uh, around menstruation, which reinforces this invisibility of our pain, of our experiences, this is also something that we're seeing from educational settings. 
because we don't have adequate information around the female reproductive system and menstruation. We're not communicating with our providers when we go to the doctor about menstruation because we are told that pain is normal. We are told that heavy bleeding is normal. There is acceptable discomfort around menstruation and it's thought to be just a part of the experience. Um, and then there are menstrual myths that are perpetuated by our peers, our parents, our providers, and pop culture. It's everywhere, every, every, everywhere, especially, side note, in horror films. Menstruation is always something that is um, bad or connected to like evilness in horror films. So we know that this silence around menstruation continues and it leaves people who menstruate without answers to their questions and without access to necessary medical services to help alleviate medical discomfort, talking about pain, talking about heavy bleeding. So part of the things that uh, myself and the group of researchers that I work with, a group that we call Dr. Period Hackers, we have a Twitter account to provide some of this medical uh, education, what we're doing is we are currently, we have currently launched a study. We are currently collecting data. I will share the link to the survey for anyone who's interested in um, taking our survey. And if you want to share it with your peer networks, that would be amazing. So our study wants to understand the impact of low levels of menstrual education on the invisibility of menstruation, our access to menstrual services, our sources of menstrual information, and these sociocultural beliefs that shape what we think about menstruation. So we want to identify barriers. We want to understand the access to menstrual health. We want to identify sources of information. And then we want to talk about these myths that we are, are being told over and over. So we have launched a quantitative study. It's available on the internet. It takes probably, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes to take. We're recruiting uh, participants from our social media posts, our professional listservs, our menstrual health organizations, places like the National Hemophilia Foundation, who is hosting this talk. We're sending it out to all of our friends, our family, bugging them to send it to whoever we can get, uh, whoever is interested. So in a way, it's kind of snowball sampling because we're relying on these peer networks that we can tap into. We started conducting uh, and collecting data a couple of weeks ago, um, and it'll go on until we hit probably about 500 participants. So far, we have, uh, I think we're up to like 75, 80. I didn't check today, but as of yesterday, we're almost to 80. Um, so our inclusion criteria is you need to be anyone between the ages of 18 and 45. You have to have ever experienced menstruation. You need to live in the U.S. for at least six months a year because we think that that probably impacts um, the education that you're getting. You need to be able to read and understand English. This survey is only available in English, and you have to have access to the internet to be able to take the, the survey. And again, we're hoping for about 500 respondents in total. If we can get more, that would be fantastic. Um, so we have a series of questions in our survey, um, just kind of Factors about your identity, we're asking about sexual orientation, gender identity, age, um, your income level, your education level, where you live in the United States, things like that. We have certain healthcare questions. If you have a current primary care provider, um, if you've ever communicated with them about menstruation, your comfort level around talking to your providers about this. We have questions about your menstruation, your experience of, of uh, having a period, what collection methods you use, how frequently you change um, your pads, if you have any kind of leakage, if you use double protection, if you pass clots, how big those clots are. We ask all about your medical history, uh, your birth control use, your hormone use. Um, if you're a person who uh, uses gender affirming hormones as well, we ask about that. Um, we ask about sexual activity specifically also while menstruating. I'm really interested in period sex and the kind of cultural beliefs around that. Uh, we ask if you have a history of bleeding disorders as well. And then we ask about social menstruation. Uh, so this idea of where you're getting your information, what slang you use, what cultural practices um, might influence that, how menstruation has impacted sports or your ability to go to school, things like that. Um, and we have a number of planned papers uh, that we are going to write once we have all of our data collected. Um, we want to look at information sources. Uh, we want to look at period slang. We want to look at menstrual art and advertising. We have a couple of a few target journals that we want to publish in. Um, and depending on the number of participants and their identity, the identities of the participants, um, 
uh, we're hoping then to um, be able to include sub analysis on gender expansive, expansive individuals um, and also people within the bleeding disorder community. I see that there's a question. Are there concerns about having the survey only in English as it leaves out non-speaking individuals? Yes, absolutely. Um, this is an excellent question. It's just, it's one of the, the things that comes up um, because of who we have on our research staff. We don't have anyone um, who is fluent in Spanish uh, in, in our research. I speak a bit of Spanish, but not medical Spanish. Um, it's something that we would love to do again and maybe expand out into um, communities where English isn't the first language. Yeah, that's an excellent question. With all research and all survey design, there is inherent weaknesses, and this is definitely one of ours. So yeah, yeah, excellent question. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see what other things here. Um, and it's a group effort. We have a number of people who worked with us. We have myself, my, we call each other our partner in crime, Bethany Samuelson Ben now. She's a, hem uh, a hematologist who works out in Oregon. Uh, we work with her medical resident, Annabelle Frank, who is in uh, California. We have a number of research assistants, um, Hajar Abusef, Mary Dada, Titi Flee, uh, Gabrielle Figueroa, Barbie Kim, Sidra Tipperani, Nicole Wong, um, Tess Olson, who also works with us as well, from a bunch of different backgrounds, from a bunch of different schools. So it's very, very, very much a team effort. This is not anything that we could do alone. And I think the beautiful thing about um, our little research team is we have people from the medical profession. We have people like me who are in public health, who are in social sciences. Um, we have uh, people who are studying communication that are working with us. Uh, one of our research assistants, Barbie, um, is getting her MFA and she's interested in like period and menstrual art and things like that. So we're bringing in a bunch of different disciplines to look at this menstrual question, not just from a medical perspective, not just from a public health perspective, but from the way that menstruation actually touches and impacts our lives in a lot of different ways. Um, these are all of the references for the things that I said. And then as we're transitioning to that Q and A part, I'm just checking the time. Um, I'm gonna leave us with a, a, a song by Ani DeFranco called Blood in the Boardroom. And we're gonna just look at some different uh, menstrual art as a way to kind of give people time to think about the questions that they might have um, and just look at some really cool art. Oh, before, sorry, before we do that, <laughs> I forgot. I just spent all this time talking about our menstrual health survey. So here's the link to the survey. Um, we will drop it into the chat in a little bit. You can also take a picture of the QR code and it'll take you directly to the survey. So I'll pause for just a second um, to let people do that. Okay. And we can put it back up later, but just so this way we actually do get to the menstrual art and then to the questions and answers. Ooh. Yeah, so menstrual art. Um. Oh, 
The big brown looks on their white. So just um, up there are my uh, Twitter handle and the Dr. Period Hackers Twitter handle as well, and my email in case anyone wants to get in touch. Um, we tweet every Monday. We do Menstrual Monday where we talk about just something interesting about menstruation. And then we do a Fun Fact Friday where we talk about a fun fact about menstruation. Um, and we will also be pushing our surveys out on both of the both of the Twitter accounts um, and other things as well. So I will stop sharing my slides now so people can ask questions that they might have. Um, yeah. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, before we get started, we just have a general announcement. It's time to lace up your running shoes. NHF is participating in the 2023 United Airlines New York City Half Marathon on Sunday, March 19th, 2023. I think this is a good little plug because you mentioned being active while on our period. So don't let that stop you from participating. We're now accepting applications to represent NHF and the United States Airlines New York City half. Travel stipends are available. You can visit hemophilia.org slash events to learn more. And I do have a couple questions for you already, Excellent. which is exciting. So I'm gonna start with the first one of what has been your biggest learning experience from Dr. Period Hackers? I think it's just how much people are not talking about menstruation and how, like, even with myself, like when we were, when Bethany and I were going to start this. So we, let me back up and tell a little story for a second. We've been working on this project for maybe 18 months. She and I have actually never met each other in person. Um, we were introduced by a high school friend of mine who is just a random Twitter follower of hers. And so when we started talking, the, the thing that kind of struck uh, both of us about starting this process, Dr. Period Hackers, is how, how passionate we were about this and how upset we were that nobody was talking about periods and just how everywhere it is. And the one of the most uh, rewarding things, I think, for both of us is now how many students we have that are working with us and how many people are like, yeah, why don't we talk about menstruation? So I hope that we're starting this like little revolution um, about talking about periods, but it's just, it's amazing to me that the people that we engage with on uh, through our Twitter handle and just kind of in general, they want this information. They want to talk about their periods and they're just still so shy about it because it's so stigmatized. So to me, that's something that kind of constantly comes back is we see all of these like empowered people who menstruate, who are involved in medicine and in public health and just other disciplines where they're very outspoken. But when you talk about periods, people kind of 
they shut down a little bit because we've been told that you should like, oh, you shouldn't talk about your period and you definitely shouldn't say blood. You should say, you know, on the rag, I have ant flow, all of this kind of hidden language around it. That's a really, really great question. Yeah. Awesome. So what is the best way to enter this field? Uh, just, just to do it. Honestly, like reach out to people who are doing interesting things. Uh, this is kind of just my general life advice. If you see somebody out there who's doing something that you think is cool or interesting, reach out to them. Most people would be happy to sit down and at least talk to you. And if not talk to you, they maybe would be offering even more like um, opportunities to work with them on their research or think of different ways that um, you can have this sort of impact. Uh, I'm the faculty sponsor for a club um, that looks at broadly speaking, like women and femme health issues. Um, and uh, one of the things that they do now is they make menstrual kids to take to shelters where people who are unstably housed are living um, and think about how they can like get period products back out there to communities and populations that need them. We had just yesterday, somebody reach out, uh, a doctoral student from uh, the University of Arizona reached out to us through our Dr. Period Hackers Twitter account and was like, hey, would you be willing to put together like a one page fact sheet when I go out and put together these like menstrual kits that I then donate in my local community? And we're like, yeah, absolutely. We would love to partner. Like there just, there aren't enough people doing this work. So I think it's an easy, an easy thing to, to get involved with if you really want to. Wonderful. Thank you. So how do you respond to someone who says that this is gross or too far, or you can see the reaction in their face or body? How do you best bring them to bring them slowly into understanding? Uh, so then I, I just talk about kind of like the things I talk about today, you know, like, well, this is something that bodies do. It's a part of people's everyday lives. You have, you know, like you can have the menstrual experience that you want. We have that technology today through medicine to either suppress your menstrual cycle altogether by continually taking pills or using uh, different types of IUDs can, can uh, suppress your bleeding. Um, and just this idea of, you know, talking to them a little bit about maybe why they're uncomfortable, if they're like uncomfortable taking them maybe aside and talking about it kind of more privately. I also, maybe it's like a, an overshare, but I also just like to be really open and honest with my experience. Like, I was somebody the first time I got my period, like my very, very, very first period, I didn't tell my mom about it for a full 12 hours because I was embarrassed and I didn't know what was happening. And I was just like, if I just wish and hope really, really, really hard, this will all just go away. Maybe I fell down. I probably just like, I have a cut and that's what's happening. And I just, I didn't know. Um, and I also, so there was that part of the reaction. And then when I did tell my mom, I knew that it was going to be this like big moment that we were going to have to talk about. And I just didn't want that. Um, so I try to just remind people that there are all different ways that they can experience menstruation. It's something that they can be very visible about if they're comfortable with it. It's something that they can be very comfortable with, but not be very visible about. And there, there's no, there's no wrong way to menstruate there's, or experience your menstruation or talk about your menstruation. There's just the way that you talk about it and think about it and finding the way that works for you is the most important thing because you should be talking to at least your medical provider about it if there are issues, but you should also be comfortable if you're a young person talking to an older sibling or a parent or a guardian about it. Um, if you are somebody who has a partner who is looking to become pregnant or you're partnered with uh, another another menstruator talking about these things and negotiating it and just kind of being comfortable with each other's bodies is an important part of, of sexual pleasure and intimacy. Um, and you should, you should be comfortable around the important people in your life. I've also done a number of podcasts um, where they will ask us things like they, they to destigmatize it. They'll be like, you know, where are you in your cycle? And you're like, oh, I'm on day three of my period, which actually is true. This is the third day. So I should be done bleeding by later today or maybe tomorrow. So just to kind of normalize that conversation, it's just, it's something my body does. It can be really cool. You can think it's not really cool, but it's just something bodies do. I love that. Thank you so much. <laughs> so how can I help uh, others experiencing period poverty? Excellent question. I think the, the thing that we can do the most is we can take political action. We can write to our Congress people and say that we they should consider removing the period tax on the different products. 
um, especially those 35 states that tax them as luxury goods, they don't need to tax menstrual products at all. That's, I think, the first step. I think also then advocating for um, people who menstruate that are experiencing incarceration or who are low income, pushing for policy changes in prisons and jail settings, um, including the and including the reduction of tax or making products free or available for purchase for people who are using SNAP or food stamps or WIC is also really important. Um, so those are kind of big high level things that will take a long time to change that are talking about changing systems. Um, but a more immediate thing is whenever there are natural disasters and um, uh, charitable organizations, relief organizations are going in, one of the things that they never get donations for that is critically needed are menstrual products. Most cities and towns also have shelters for people who are homeless or are unstably housed. They also always need menstrual product donations. People don't think about that. They're always like, oh, people need food to eat, which is absolutely true. But for people who menstruate, they don't have access in those settings to menstrual products. And when the organizations themselves are trying to buy products, they often have to then allocate certain parts of budgets. Budgets are limited, funding is limited. So they might not be getting enough products that they need, or they might not be buying higher quality products, like with really good adhesive and things like that, which then means if you're using a pad without good adhesive, it can slip, which then can lead to leaks, which are potentially embarrassing. And for some people, um, might put them at risk of violence and things like that. So just two really practical solutions getting out there, getting in the face of your political representatives, and then to finding places where you can donate. Um, and also then pushing, this kind of goes back to maybe like a hybrid of both, um, pushing for facilities to offer free menstrual supplies so that they're not like the ones that you need a quarter for, a couple of quarters for, like whoever has those, the dispensers are never filled. So you can talk, you can even start by like talking to your schools or the organizations that you work for about just having products out there, or if you're able to, if you, if you're, if you have financial means, you can just supply those things in the bathroom um, and making sure that they're in common spaces, uh, bathrooms of all genders, especially if you have an all access to an all gender or a gender free or a gender neutral bathroom. Um, but just making sure that you remember that not everyone that menstruates um, identifies as a woman and not everyone who menstruates uses female bathrooms to so making sure that we're really pushing for access just in restrooms in general. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. So how would you recommend that we start a conversation with our doctors about our cycle? I don't want my doctor to dismiss my concerns. Uh, so most of the time when you go to the doctor, they will ask you when the first day of your last period was. So I think that's a really great way to bring up the conversation is when they ask that um, or ask if you're currently menstruating, that's when you can stop the conversation and be like, I have questions about my menstrual cycle. I am a very annoying patient because I'm like, wait a minute, let me grab my phone. Here are my list of questions. That is what you need to do. You need to think about the questions that you want to ask in advance. If you're nervous about talking to your provider about it, that's a really good way to make sure that when you're not in that kind of anxious brain space, you have that list of questions. And that way, when you are in that anxious brain space, you have them already written down um, and you can rely on that. Um, and if your provider is not giving you good answers, ask the question again, or if you don't understand the answer they're giving you, ask those follow-up questions. Our health insurance literally pays our physicians to answer our questions. So remember, you're not slowing them down. You're not a burden. It is literally your physician's job to answer your questions. They are being paid to answer your questions. If your provider doesn't ask about the first day of your last period, um, then you should just, there, there should be a time when they're asking if you have any questions, that's a great place to bring it up. If you don't feel comfortable with the provider that you're currently going to see, find a different doctor. I know that sounds, it sounds like, oh, just find a different doctor. I know it's not easy, but you can find doctors that are better uh, about meeting your needs. Um, I think community-based organizations are really great for that. I'm a huge fan of Planned Parenthood. That is where I get my reproductive health care. Um, because they're asking inclusive questions. They seem to have more time for my care. And I'm just, I feel like I get better care there. Um, also finding nurse practitioners. Um, they generally, because they're trained as nurses, they have a bit of a different approach from a physician. So they, I feel like, at least in my experience, 
are more, uh, more responsive to me and my questions and more open to them. So it's about, it's about finding the right provider for you, which I know takes a lot of work and people don't want to go back to the doctor or, or spend time finding them, but ask your friends. Uh, that's another thing that I do is like, uh, whenever I'm thinking about changing doctors or I move to a different place, I ask my friends where they go and if they like their provider, that's, that's a great way to kind of open that conversation. You can no, also oh, can oh, go ahead. No, yeah. go ahead. You can also find a doula. Um, doulas are not just for labor and delivery. They're also reproductive health doulas, abortion doulas, people that can help you think through the questions that you should be asking. They can help you practice those conversations. And if you're comfortable, can even uh, comfortable with them attending the, the medical visit with you, they could even do that. Doulas are, are really wonderful and are underutilized. That is wonderful. I would have never thought to reach yeah. out to a doula. Doulas are really cool. <laughs> that is really great. Okay, well, that is it for us for questions today. Thank you so much again for taking the time to join us this afternoon. I really Thank appreciate it. Thank you so it. much for having me. It's yeah. always a pleasure to talk with all of you and to talk about menstrual health and periods. I love it. Yes, we appreciate your time and your expertise. And I'd also like to thank each one of our viewers for joining us, regardless of whatever streaming platform you are on. Please note that this recorded webinar will be available on Friday, February 3rd at hemophilia.org under the events tab with all of our archived webinars. Also available in the events tab is our upcoming schedule for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Uh, you'll even find that information for the New York Half Marathon in there as well. Thank you for joining us this afternoon and have a wonderful week. We will see you next Wednesday.